Okay, so the, um, I'm being told we can start when we're ready. Okie dokie. Um, all right, let me turn off my phone. All right. All right, so I guess I'll just, I'll just go, right, GNCRT? Time to go. All right, so um, hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to this webinar, uh, Black Lives Matter, Comics as a Lens for Social Justice. You are in the right place, and we're glad to have you join us today. My name is Demosa Weber Bay, born and raised and quarantining in Queens, New York City, the ancestral home of the Lenape people. My pronouns are she and her. I am a librarian who loves comics, and I technically belong to three comic book clubs. Two of them are based in New Mexico, 7000 BC, and the Native Comic Book Society. The third is an organization within the American Library Association, the Graphic Novel and Comic Book Roundtable. Today, I am here as a member of both the Graphic Novel Comic Book Roundtable and the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, representing our ongoing collaboration. During this hour, we will share a comics reading list of 50 titles for juvenile, teen, and adult audiences. We'll discuss the relevance of comics to the Black Lives Matter movement and beyond with Stacey Robinson and John Jennings, co-creators with writer Tony Medina of I Am Alfonso Jones, first graphic novel for young readers addressing the Black Lives Matter movement and one of our featured comic books on the list. Before I go any further though, on behalf of our task force and the organizations that I'm part of, we'd like to acknowledge the life and the work of Chadwick Boseman, who worked as an instructor at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Literature, part of the New York Public Library. Their statement, which notes that Chadwick Boseman embodied the principles and possibilities of Black culture and history, will be linked to in the comments section. May he rest in power. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I just want to quickly share with you guys the list that we have created. All right. Can you guys see that? <clears throat> yep. All right, so let me do full screen on the view there. All right, so this is the first page, and I'm just going to let it sit there while I uh, tell you a little bit about it. This list is of 50 comics for juvenile, teen, YA, and adult audiences, and it's centered on Black creators, Black stories, and Black history for all ages. The list includes many titles from our earlier comics list, while also adding others. The goal of this list is not to be prescriptive, a prescriptive spectrum of all the subject or format content out there in the landscape of Black stories or comics, but it's a step, another step towards building collections and conversations that spark hope, demand justice, erase, ad address erasure, and agitate for learning, using both sides of our brain through words and pictures. Because when Black lives are lost, Black stories are lost, to quote Stacey Robinson. So I'm gonna go to the second pages here and just tell you that the criteria that we had for inclusion on this list is that the title had to be published sequential art with one or more of the following elements. Created by a black storyteller, displays empathy and respect for black bodies, introduces readers to black art, people, history, organizations and communities, represents black experiences both domestically and throughout the world, showcases a diversity of artistic mediums, includes the lived experiences of black people from all demographics, reinforces black stories of success, resistance, endurance, and love. Employed, employs a wide array of genres, demonstrates an understanding of cultural nuance, represents independent and non-traditional publishing, includes stories of ancient black civilizations as well as black people's continued existence in the future, improves access to authentic Black stories for all patrons, and exposes Black creators to wider audiences. Not all of these elements that I listed are required for inclusion, and uh, to date, all of these titles are in English. And then I just wanted to note, I'm just going to go back so you can see that front page again with that wonderful image. 
see coming out of the fisk there. Um, this was designed by Crystal Chen. She's a young adult librarian at the New York Public Library, um, did the graphic design and all of the illustrations for this list. Uh, she has an art and printmaking background and was a 2018 ALA Emerging Leader. She's interested in the intersection of art, activism, and social justice and how libraries can create inclusive, responsive programming for youth. And so that list we're going to share with you guys. Uh, you can find it on the Graphic Novel Comic Book Roundtable website as well as the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. All right, and so now I'm going to introduce our speakers to you and then we're gonna get started. Stacy Robinson is a visual artist and assistant professor of graphic design and illustration at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and was a 2019-2020 Nasir Jones Hip Hop Fellow. As a member of the Black Speculative Arts Movement, Stacy has traveled internationally, having difficult conversations surrounding ideas of Black liberated futures. As one half of the collaborative team Black Kirby with artist John Jennings, he creates graphic novels, gallery exhibitions, lectures, and illustrated syllabi one of the, that deconstruct the work of comic book creator Jack Kirby to reimagine resistance spaces inspired by Black diasporic cultures. His latest graphic novel, I Am Alfonso Jones with writer Tony Medina is available from Lee and Lowe Books. Connect with Stacy on Twitter at Professor, at Prof S.A. Robinson on Instagram at Stacy A. Robinson and on Facebook, Stacy Avian Robinson. John Jennings is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside. Jennings is co-editor of the Eisner award-winning collection, The Blacker the Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art. Jennings is also a 2016 Nasir Jones Hip Hop Studies Fellow with the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. Jennings' current projects include the horror anthology, Box of Bones, the coffee table book, Black Comics Returns with Damian Duffy, the Eisner winning Bram Stoker award winning New York Times best selling graphic novel adaptation of Octavia Butler's classic dark fantasy novel Kindred. Jennings is also the founder and creator of the Abrams Megascope line of graphic novels. Connect with John on Twitter at J.I. Jennings and on Instagram at John Jennings Art. And we will put the, all of that information up for you guys as we go. All right, so all of that to get started and say, uh, we have our first question, which I challenged uh, our panelists with when we talked earlier, which is why comics? <laughs> why, uh, we, you know, the question that we've been getting from different folks that we've been putting this, you know, project and this list out there is why are we, you know, focused on a comics at this time in particular? Right. And I so, because we're that. asking you to justify your existence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and we're like, you know, and I was just, we were just talking this about this before we started it was like, I literally teach a course just on the medium of comics, you know, because I think one of the things that happens is there's a conflation between genre and medium, you know, because for me, the, the question is like, well, why television, you know, and this is something, you know, Stacy was talking about too, like, you know, why Hulu, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump in really quickly and just kind of talk a little bit about the form, you know, of comics and a little bit about you know, just uh, black images and resistance in general, uh, kind of speed through a few things. I want to have more questions, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to start sharing screens. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, Great. cool. All right, awesome. I feel like the question should be, why are we still asking this question? Why comes? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so, hold up a second. Well, you know, I was, as I was saying before we got started, we often have to answer the question, why libraries? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Let me, um, I'm scrolling up, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm like... yeah. And so, you know, as folks are going to make collection decisions and spend money, you know, on then libraries have limited budgets now, um, obviously even before everything that hit with the pandemic. So, you know, picking and choosing how to spend your money, someone may, may have to make a case to their supervisor, right. to their community on why they're gonna spend money on comics. Mm -hmm. It, um, the screen share didn't work, right? Let me see, I'm gonna try it. Now. It's showing the slides in portion, there we go. All right, how's that? Good, I see both slides now. Is that good? Okay. Uh, I see a black screen now. Um, that is terrible. Do you see a gremlin? Because that should be a gremlin there. I'm just kidding. Are you messing with me? 
No, no. I did a black screen. Really? Oh, shoot. That's not cool. Let me see if I can. Technical difficulties. Okay. All right. Sorry, y'all. That's oh, okay. Zoom is not letting us be great right now. All right, the question is, why Zoom? Why <laughs> Zoom? Is that <laughs> right? Because what? I can't hang out with you. Stop it. All right. Let me see here. Um, I could share mine too. Yeah, I was gonna say um, just to keep it moving. Yeah. Do you want to try to share it? Yep. Okay. That's the end. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look. Everybody, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Exactly. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. So what I'll do is follow along on my little, on my other one here. So what I want to do is start off talking about like the fact that um, whenever there's a, a artistic movement or, or excuse me, whenever there's a, a political movement, there's always, there seems to be like an, an artistic response, like the black, black arts movement, um, the aforementioned uh, black speck of arts movement, which I feel is in some ways like the, um, the next generation of different types of like, you know, speculative work around black resistance. And so I wanted to pull up, you know, the great Emory Douglas's work, you know, Emory Douglas is a, you know, a minister of propaganda and, and a culture for the Black Panther Party for many years. And um, he's a cartoonist, considered a cartoonist, a graphic designer. And there's something to be said about the, the really striking um, images. You know, you can go to the next slide. Um, that, that Emory Douglas produced. And they were produced uh, in, you know, very, in a very quick fashion. Uh, as far as like why comics, we're, we're talking about like the fact that comics speak, speak very symbolically. Um, anybody can make a comic actually too. Uh, basically, if you have like a pencil, uh, any type of mark making piece, or as you can see photos, uh, you can actually, you know, reproduce those, put those in a sequence and then kind of go from there. Um, you can go to the next slide. The um, acclaimed uh, comic scholar, uh, Scott McCloud, created this book called um, Understanding Comics, which he, and he's kind of like the Marshall McLuhan of comics, you know? So, so he basically, one of the first things he tried to do was to separate the idea of the genre from the medium, because usually in our country, um, when we think about comics, we're thinking about like superheroes and funny animals or like funny animals that are superheroes, like, you know, like Mighty Mouse or something like that. Um, but there's a conflation between like genre and medium that, you know, it's because of like how, super, how superheroes have, have become like so ubiquitous. So a lot of times people don't think of them as being very serious. But the truth of the matter is that it's a very complex medium of, of exchange of information. So Scott McCloud defines comics as juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information or to produce an aesthetic response in the viewer, right? So right. next slide. Um, you can go to the next part. So really quickly, here's a couple of images from myself and Stacy. Um, when uh, the, the, the mother manual shooting happened in South Carolina, I responded with art. So I, I did this particular piece and I also did the piece, uh, it's like a Black Power Twitter image that um, is actually in the Smithsonian in the, in the um, in African American Culture Museum now. And it was a, it was a direct response. There's something about like, the symbolic nature of how like line and symbol speak to, um, you know, basically to, to, the, to, the, to the moment, so to speak. And uh, Stacey, you want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the piece on the, on the right? Yeah, this, uh, really quickly, this is a, a Sun Ra piece. I imagined him as a ship uh, taking Black people into the future. And uh, he's rocking a Harriet Tubman Jesus piece. Uh, and some of the images that he's embracing are from the Black Lives Matters movement. And mm -hmm. one of the images is even from a Wu-Tang Clan video where a uh, master killer is standing upon a building and he's speaking to the crowd of people and an elderly black man hears the message, right? So um, this is one from my thesis show, but as, as Sunrise doing this, he's also transmitting from his antenna um, to that unknown space. And if you look at the, the, the piece, it forms like an X, which is, representing right. um, the unknown, but we still got to get there. Like, right. Whether we know it or not, we, we still got to get there. That's right. Because Black futures matter too. And I think, honestly, as Black Kirby, that's what attracts us so much to the speculative, because Black joy is still a radical act. 
black and and also black future the idea of like you know imagining a better future for black people is still a radical act right mm -hmm. um, can you go to the uh, next slide please so when we think about um protest art and we think about the idea of um fighting back against systemic issues we think about um we think about the images like this right when we have yeah. Um, this is classic, I'm a man, right? Um, right before the assassination of Dr. King, right? Um, we, we see the text and the image juxtaposed, just like uh, Scott McCloud is talking about. And sometimes they're not, they're, it's, they're inseparable. But, you know, this particular phrase came from, next slide, this particular piece, which is like, um, almost like a logo for the abolitionist movement. Am I not a man and a brother? This is a cartoon. This is, this is essentially a, a cartoon in, in, in every sense of the word because you actually have image and text juxtaposed. And comics don't always have to have text juxtaposed. It's really about the images themselves being in sequence. Yeah. But the idea is that when you start putting things into a sequence, you know, we start to make order from them. We start to actually think about them as a story. We start to project ourselves onto these, these, these images. In fact, um, Scott McCloud also talks about the fact that when you start to abstract um, information from images, then it, they, they reach more people. So think about the idea of, say, seeing, seeing yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in a light socket. Like, so every time you see a light socket, it looks like a screaming face now, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. Or the front of a car looks like a face because we're projecting ourselves into these kind of abstract ideas. Um, uh, next slide, right quick. One of my favorite examples of this is uh, the Jacob Lawrence Great Migration series, right? So under here, you see during the World War, there was a Great Migration North by Southern Negroes. That's the title of this piece, right? So imagine this, you're walking into um, a, you know, a, a gallery and you see these, these, um, these paintings on display, usually in order, they show them in order. He actually is telling a story you know, with these images. How is this not a comic? You know, it's, you know, it's functioning like a comic actually, because it's really graphic imagery, very powerful colors, and underneath we have a caption that is describing what's happening in the image, right, as the title. And again, if you walk into a space like this with, with Jacob Lawrence's work, it's basically a, um, it's basically a comic. You know, um, the other thing on uh, next slide that we're going to talk about really quickly too is the idea that comics teach multimodal literacy. Now we talk about literacy a lot in different and different ideas. I'm sorry I had to put this up here, but uh, <laughs> they just use so many boxes, right? I so that, yeah, when you're looking at when you're looking at like a, a cable news um, a report, you're seeing like these different panels, right? And you're seeing you're reading uh, what's going on with the with the with the person who's giving the news to us, a newscaster. A lot of times you have a Nasdaq running under there. You have all these different boxes that are happening at the same time, and we're reading all of these simultaneously. And I think it's kind of interesting that we're not really taught to, to like deal with these images so, so easily. I mean, it's almost like a better question would be like, well, why isn't media literacy taught earlier in our, in our, in our matriculation as, 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 as human beings? Um, go, um, what is next slide? For uh, school librarians with that. Yeah, we'll go to the next slide and you'll see what I, uh, the other thing I did right quick. All right. What I did was actually took, you know, I, I flipped it sideways and, um, and actually did like a, a panel breakdown. You know, this looks like a comic to me. You know, it's starting to feel like these are different like town panel straight panel uh, striations. And so um, yeah. it's interesting because and Stacy's going to talk a little, a little bit in a second about his 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 project that he did with Buffalo with Sepa Gallery. But essentially, we're talking about sequential images that are dealing directly with um, different types of social. Uh, uh, aspects. And I think that because of the immediacy of symbolic communication, and like again, the, the uh, kind of abstract nature of comics, it speaks so widely so, and so readily. I mean, just think about how powerful, um, about how powerful uh, uh, um, political cartoons are, right? right? Really immediate, you know. Um, let's see, next slide right quick. So this is one of the, this is one of probably one of the most important pages from one of the most important comics ever created, right? This is like from Spider-Man, right? Um, this is this is when Peter Parker discovers that, you know, the the robber that he let go actually killed his uncle Ben, and that's when he discovers that great power comes with great responsibility. Now, what I did was I imagined like, what if each one of these these uh, panels was a screen? So what I did is I took like 
you know, iPads and, and cell phones and kind of like built a little abstract, what they call an abstract comic, right? Because again, you know, once you start seeing images in a sequence, you start to make a story. But to me, when I see something like a panel or like I see, I see comic books, I see, I see actually like these sequential stories that are happening. And what I'm getting at is these particular types of narratives actually teach multimodal literacy or they, are, they're, they could be a vehicle to teach different types of literacies because it's not just reading, writing, arithmetic anymore, right? Um, we have these different ways that we kind of uh, access the world. And honestly, these days, I mean, we see more images in a day than people from the 17th century see their entire lives, would have seen their entire lives, but we're not really given the tools to actually unpack those things. So anyway. All right, so I want to uh, really quickly, um, Stacy, talk about the uh, the SEPA Gallery project. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, our latest Black Kirby project, well, the one that before the one we're working on now, actually, <laughs> was uh, came about a, uh, about two, uh, well, around June, around June first. Um, we were commissioned to come up with um, text and images that spoke to the current movement galvanized the people, motivated the people, and um, but then left left a particular conversation in play, right? So these are still up in Buffalo. They went up, I wanna say end of August, I believe, uh, beginning of September. And they're currently up, I think they're going to show um, maybe even next month, I'm not really sure. But this was a really simple, I say simple. Uh, I say this is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> So you can do these too, by the way. <laughs> Here's how they function, right? So for people who are driving by, they can take in just the text. Hashtag Black Family Matters, for example. Uh, for those who are walking by, they actually can view all 12 of these images as, as a, a, a curated art exhibition. They can take in the imagery. But what they're supposed to do is sit with the work, analyze the work, and converse about the work. So uh, SIPA did an entire campaign, SIPA Gallery in Buffalo did an entire campaign where if you found the first person to find all 12 billboards in the document that would get a signed set of prints. And these, I wanted these to function in particular ways. These are also uh, bumper stickers, right? So they function in, these multi, in this multimodal way where people can take in the images, absorb, you know, deconstruct the images, analyze, well, what's not being talked about, for example, in this, in this uh, particular piece of Black family mattering, right? Understand that family structures are very different, but I can't, I could have illustrated 12 images, <laughs> one for each billboard that discussed a different type of family structure. Um, but this was meant for the audience to actually interact with, kind of like a comic book. So you can put all 12 hashtag uh, Black Matters pieces together and create a particular narrative that are all set, um, set throughout East Buffalo. Um, and then as you go through, you can go through the next slide. I think there are a few of those. A few of them, yeah, you can go through. Yeah. So obviously Black Lives Matters and, and these uh, multi-generations of Black people, you know, as targets, Black power matters, right? Black justice matters. So you can stay here for a moment. Um, you know, this this Black woman has justice and, you know, imagine that justice is not blind, right? Um, but justice doesn't, it might not need to be blind. We need to talk about that, right? And as she's peeking through the colonial cloth, that covers her eyes while she's wearing a pan-African colored dress. She's looking at the storm uh, coming behind her that, that is injustice, right? So, and if you notice her hair is gray, right? Justice is, is, is um, elderly, right? Justice is, is an old way of, of, of thinking and imagining, but we need to reimagine justice as well, right? So go to the next one, please. I wonder if that's, uh, is that the last one? And of course, <laughs> Black history mattering, right? So, and in this piece, in this collection of images, there is a Black futures matter as well, right? So we have to, um, Black history is represented through the, the, um, uh, the Sankofa, right? And the infinity symbol, right? So as we are Sankofa, you know, the Ghanaian term from the Akan people, meaning to go back and fetch or go back and get our history. Um, as we're proceeding into, into the future. That too is a revolutionary act. So that might be the last one, I'm not sure. Yeah, the last one, I, I, was, I was using, um, you, can, you can flip 
of Florence, um, in Spain. Um, <clears throat> so I was using the the, the, the uh, infinity symbol as a linkage to um, you know our to kindred right quick, and I, and we don't have to stay on these super long, but um, you know Damien Duffy and I, and actually Stacy worked as a coloring uh, coloring tech tech on this as well. Him and his son actually uh, worked on this book with us <clears throat> in coloring. Um, well to, yes. Ooh, nice. <laughs> we just found it's, it's going to be uh, published in Korean now. So exciting. Um, yeah, we just found it like maybe yesterday. So, you know, this was a really great um, opportunity for us to, that has opened up. And I saw that this is actually on, Kindred is on your list too, correct? Or is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, we had serious Octavia Butler conversation. Okay. Well, she's, I mean. Uh, this book is, is so, I mean, key for me. The first library job that I had, I had to do a book talk, you know, oh, and wow. I didn't know exactly what a book talk was. And so I okay. went in there and I talked about Kindred for like half an hour. <laughs> oh, wow. <clears throat> Could you, uh, go to the next slide, please. And you can go through these actually pretty quickly. I, I just want to talk about just, um, you know, just the process of going through and, and adapting these into, it just makes the, it makes the story, I think, in some ways more accessible. There are certain things in uh, when you're doing like adaptations that you're pulling out of the text, you know, and let me know if you guys have questions about these too, but, you know, they actually like, you know, very challenging, uh, 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 you know, just taking her work and trying to make them, um, you know, come to life. And so I think as far as like why comics, I mean, that, that particular idea of like translation and transmutation, it also, uh, they also teach uh, a lot of things about crit critical thinking skills, um, like, like, you know, uh, prose reading, uh, comics are what McLuhan called a cold medium, which means that there's a lot of projection of yourself into making meaning on the page. Right. You know, of course, you know, Zoom and, and uh, you know, the internet and, th and television, of course, are like a lot, uh, well, you know, digital, digital TV are a lot more um, hot medium where you get like more or film. It's like you're getting more of the information. But with, um, you know, with, 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 with comics, you have to learn, you know, the pantomime, like a lot of like things around like body language and, and things of that nature that you have to learn how to, how to essentially you become like an actor, you know what I'm saying, when, you, when you're doing these. But you can go cool. through these in the parable of the sower too. Let me, okay, I'm sorry. You had a no, I was just gonna um, say if you could explain maybe to people with like how the action happens between the panels. I think some of us know what, the, know what that <clears throat> is. Oh yeah, the gutter, you know what I'm saying? Basically, if you look at like the structure of the books, um, the different, the different uh, pictorial elements are called panels and the spaces between the panels are called gutters. And so basically to go uh, to borrow from, um, from uh, Scott McCloud again, the, what's happening is that you are actually making the story happen through what he calls closure, right? So for instance, if you look at like the image of uh, Lauren Olamina from Parable of Sword, these, you know, the, the young lady who's asleep, you know, we have this kind of like sequencing where she's thinking and you can see the um, you can see like the uh, the languages that the Damien put in where she's she's actually listening to her, her parents and then of course the eye moves right and so you kind of actually start to create a type of movement just by imagining it right and it's the gutter that allows that <clears throat> the other thing too is like when you see a big spread like this that means you're supposed to linger on it longer mm. it takes a little bit longer to read so basically it's it's meant to kind of like be the the almost like a, just a, a wide establishing shot if you think about film language, right? And basically like when you see bigger pieces, you're supposed to linger on a little bit longer, that kind of thing. But this was an amazing, um, you know, opportunity to work on this work. Of course now, Parallel of Soul seems almost like super prescient and kind of scary. Like how, you know, if you look at, it's almost like, you know, when I walk outside, I'm in Parallel of Soul in some ways, oh, because I now live in Southern California. So it's like, oh my good, there we go. I mean, and the, the other term that I learned when I was looking through this one, oh, um, yeah. the ink about braiding, which yes, uh, yeah. You know, so I think that when people often think like comics are not that you know serious, and yet the actual kind of analysis when I go through reading some of the more technical you know papers about it mm -hmm. is incredibly detailed. I mean, when I was reading the section about braiding, um. I'm, you know, I'm reading through this and it sounds like, it says uh, the um, <laughs> African and African diasporic art forms, tributary contributors to the emergence of modern art. I'm reading through all this stuff. I'm like, this sounds like parliament, funkadelic. <laughs> yes. But luckily I do speak that. 
<laughs> and as I was going through this, I was just, you know, really under like braiding, you know, obviously has meaning for me um, with hair and African American culture, but the idea that the the characters kind of balance each other out on the page. Can you explain That's right. That? Well, um, so a lot of times with braiding, for instance, you're looking at, um, and this comes from the French uh, analysis too, by the way. There's a, the French actually call comics band designé, and another another nickname uh, that they have for it is the ninth art, right? And there's so much like French criticism that has not been translated, unfortunately. And so one of the first books that it was, was translated, I forget the name of the book actually, brings up the topic of, of braiding. A lot of it relates to like repetitions of form, right? So for instance, if you have like a moon and then you have like a, a coin on a table or something like that, both are circular. And it's a, it's a, it's a way to, to draw the eye, you know, by braiding those images together. So that's kind of like one of the things too, it's about like formal analysis. Um, because again, we are dealing with um, a, a media form here. You know, this is not just oh, we're going to draw some pictures. There's a there's a particular way to think about you know how comics are constructed, um, storytelling wise, right? And we'll get to that later when we talk about uh, this one of our new books that Stacy's the illustrator for, actually. Um, yeah, and and Even the text bubbles right are meant to lead the eye for for the novice reader who can't necessarily interpret the images right away. You can actually follow, you know, a good layout artist like will will lay out the text bubbles in a way that you can follow the story just by following the the, the text bubbles through the panels. Right. And Damien is also our letterer too for this particular project. So he's a very talented letterer. And so <clears throat> the, the letter is almost like not only is like the doing the voiceover, if you want to use the, the idea of, of, of filmmaking, but also is um you know, designing the space with sound. He's like a sound designer, <laughs> you know, right. that kind of thing too. But also uh, is a graphic designer, you know, so you're, you know, the, the letter is actually with the image, you know, fusing together to become the medium of comics, right? Mm -hmm. So because you can follow along with the, the images, but you can also follow along with the words or depending upon what the, you know, what's going on with the, you know, with the story, maybe both at the same time, it depends, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of flexibility and, and comics are a lot more complex than, than people imagine, you know. Um, I remember actually like, you know, I, I gave uh, my father-in-law a copy of Kindred and he was like, yo, this is actually really, <laughs> this is dense. This is like reading a, this is like reading a real book, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> like heartbreaking. I was like, oh, anyway. You can go to the next slide, I think. Yeah, this is, it's just other images from, uh, from Parable of the Sower. Um, so Stacey, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, I'm Alfonso Jones quickly? Sure. So really quickly, I'm Alfonso Jones is considered the first Black Lives Matter inspired graphic novel. And um, this is the cover. I could spend some time on a cover, but I don't necessarily think I need to. Yeah, yeah. We just, I just went through and showed some process images, sure, you know, if people have questions. Yeah. yeah. So process is really important, you know, and as we're talking about process, um, especially with the, a book that's dealing with the, the, you know, the death of, you know, ironically, as I was working on this book, Alfonso was the exact age of my daughter at the time, 15. Um, and then, but Alfonso's life almost mimicked in a particular way, uh, my son's life. And because my son went to a performing arts high school, just like my daughter did. My son was a theater major. Alfonso is studying theater. There's a, a they're studying Hamlet, right, in the book. So as I'm drawing this book, in a particular way, I'm drawing my children, right? Um, right. And in a particular way, I have to be really responsible and, and uh, conveying this really dark subject matter. And as we're talking about this and talking about process, I think this is a good time for me. I wanted to pull out, um, talk about three points in em Emory Douglas's uh, manifesto on Black political art. Yep. where he says, um, point six, create art of social concerns that even a child can understand. That's right. Right? Um, point um, seven, the goal should always be to make the message clear. And point nine, create art that challenges the colonization of the imagination, right? So yeah. we're talking about why comics, right? So this is a minerist of culture uh, and propaganda for the Black Panther Party, right? You can keep going through some of these images. So imagine, like, we're talking about why comics because this is text and image, you know, placement is another form of literacy, 
right? Mm -hmm. And it allows us to imagine, and this is a great example here. If you notice, so I'll go back to that last slide, please. Mm -hmm. If you notice the, the, in the second, you can see it clearly in the second image, um, you see the placement in that third panel. Um, you see Alfonso with a hanger around his neck. And I edited that page exactly, that area right there. If you look in the next image, every time I showed that hanger, and I forget the hook of the hanger, I forgot the name of it, I actually looked that up. Um, I, I always showed that at, in that position as a question mark, mm. right? I edited it every time to show that as a question mark, right? Even at the end of the book, when you read the book, um, that the last image you see is, is the hanger. I think it says at the end, the hanger is a question mark. Right. Oh, I see it. Yeah, because I'm asking the question, right? I actually had this hope that police brutality would end mm. because I was working on this book, right? And that's the, for me, that's the magic of comics, right? I felt like the energy I was putting into this book would totally end police brutality. And it didn't, right? And it was, it was hard to grieve in this because Black death was happening at the at you know and not stopping as I was working on this book. So I'm constantly asking the question, why? You know, why, why, why? Um, keep going, please. No, I thought that this was you know a, your choice to include um, the I'm gonna do Diallo with gunshots. Yeah. The whole as time, a, you know, like funny. yeah, oh, yeah. Like, from beginning to end, that was. That's fabulous. Yeah, and that's, there's a portion of that where that becomes, um, you know, a, a, a device for, for like, you can see through his bullet holes, right? And they, right. they, they light, you know? And, you know, so there's so much to talk about with that book, but process is really important in this too, because I totally want people to bite and steal process. Um, so these, these are some of the last images we created. These are some of the rejected cover sketches. And I sat in a library, actually. I sat in my favorite library here in town. First, one of the first places I found when I landed here with this really awesome gig, I had to finish this book, you know? <laughs> so, um, and I found a really awesome library. And I basically brought um, a giant book that is torn to pieces now where I carried paper inside. And these are eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that I ripped in half. And I sketched out um, like really rough sketches. And I took a picture with then using my then iPhone 4S and I would text these to John and to my editor, right? Process is really, really important because sometimes we think that we have to have these, you know, multi-thousand dollar devices and all of that. And I'm rocking with, with stuff you can pull out of the printer at the library, <laughs> like a pencil. Right. You know, and, and you can borrow pencil and then you can, you know, use the regular paper, right? These are all rejected cover ideas. Go to the next one, please. And, but this is the, this is how we got to the final cover. So um, that sketch, that very first one you see is a really rough sketch on eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper ripped in half. Text that to John. He does the final inks, collages, some images from the interiors into the background. Damien had already designed a logo. Shout out to Damien Duffy. And then John does these really awesome covers on it. I place text on it as the design and that's the process, right? Um, totally please, if that works for you, if that helps you, um, please steal that. I can send you, I'll be happy to email any of you the process presentation so that you could share it with your classes or whatever. And I think that might be the last one. And we have one more thing, which one is more. about the character designs. Yeah. Oh, right, really awesome. So we're working with Tony. Um, this is really important for literacy too, right? So this was my first graphic novel. And the very first thing that I needed from Tony was a list of the cast of characters and how he imagined them. So what I did is I sat in a cafe, another favorite place of mine to work is in the cafe. And I took a pen out, I looked at his descriptions and his descriptions were like, yeah, so um, Alfonso's father looks like Wendell Pierce from The Wire, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And I'm like, okay, cool. Or the twins, um, I think is Lamangelo and- um, and Alfredo Rangelo, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> they look like, um, what is, oh, what is, um, I forgot that mayor's name. I forgot, uh, Mayor de Blasio, I think his sons, right? Uh -huh. 
Right, right. Or is it just, you know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was. So I had all of these really awesome references. And the um, I purposely used uh, Officer uh, Darren Wilson uh, to reference the officer who uh, killed Alfonso because I mm -hmm. wanted to, you know, I wanted to use a real, you know, once again, even for that, I didn't want to make up a person. I wanted to use someone who is, uh, who, Kill Michael Brown, right? So I wanted to use him as a reference to to reference Alfonso, but it was the communication that Tony and I had um, that allowed us to move through this really, really quickly. So in process, communication, uh, just like a really awesome relationship, uh, communication is key. Mm -hmm. See what I did there? Boom, boom, boom. And then the very last image is my pen drawing. Um, this is Alfonso's grandfather. Then you see John's first treatment of inks. John's um, highlights and then John's full rendering um, at the very bottom too. And we have one last image, it's just the opening sequence space and that's it. For, okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the very first page. I actually got the call offering me this job at U of I as I was working on this page. I was in a cafe, I just finished a lecture at SCAD in Savannah and I was drawing this book. If you see this, this is 11 by 17 typing paper. Uh, folded in half, once again, carried in that same book. And I find a cafe, pull this out, unfold the paper and draw out these really rough sketches. Um, this is the process, right? The paper I'm using at this time is, is not you know, very expensive. If you look at the very roughness of the sketches, I was texting these images to John who would pull these into, then we were using Adobe Photoshop Right. And he would do these really awesome inks and, and um, color treatments on. I got the job as I was working on this page, right? My, you know, my director was like, hey, Stacey, we'd like to officially offer you the job, negotiated pay and re, you know, research funds. Hey, that's really awesome. I say yes to all of that. Okay, I got to go because I'm working on this book that's probably going to get me tenure. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I hang up and these are the first pages. So this was very, I always think this is very important to show in the process because you can see clearly um, how almost low tech this is in a particular way. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to I want to stress too is that comics medium is a, is very collaborative or it can be very collaborative mm -hmm. actually, um, and I think by showing how, how these things are made, you know, because I ended up being like kind of project manager too for this later on in the process too. Um, let's see, and we can. Well, I was just gonna. I wanted to comment real quick on because oh, this yeah, is you know, such a powerful image that you chose to put in here. You know, depicting this moment of violence, which you know repeats over and over, and yeah. it just reminded me of um, the Incognito graphic novel, which mm -hmm. you know the title of this webinar about a lens for social justice. My professor in library school, like everything was fun, and is this the end? So do stop sharing. You know, no, no, so, no, 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 there's no. more. It wasn't, uh, there, there was more, but yes, go <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll pull it back. So then, okay. um, you know, I just thought it was, it was um, interesting because one of the things I noticed when I was uh, writing a paper, he said, you know, write a paper about a comic that has, talks about a social issue. And mm -hmm. then it's like, you know, I, I go from talking about Batman and like all kind of fun stuff. And now I'm writing him a 20 page paper on this <laughs> book in particular. And mm -hmm. one of the things I noticed was that the artist, the way he chose to draw a black man being lynched is such that the main character is never looking at, mm -hmm. the, at the guy who's being lynched, you know? So that even though the rest of the audience mm -hmm. is, you know, looking on it voyeuristically, the mm -hmm. character himself is always looking at the crowd. That's right. And observing how the crowd is interacting with this black body. So that's, I just got chills about that. That's really a great observation because that character is a reporter too, right? And, and also is there to help uncover what's going on with these lynchings too. Yeah, that's a very good observation. Ugh. I'll in my paper. <laughs> I would I would look. You should probably be scattering to my class, actually not think about it. But um no, you about to about to put you to work because <laughs> I'm like, you need to be talking to my students about what you're doing. Um, so next slide, right quick. Uh, we're gonna because I, I want to get to some of these questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I know, right? <laughs> so um, basically, what happened was I was actually texting back and forth with my executive editor Charlie Koshman, who created Abrams Comic Arts, and is that Abrams? And we were just lamenting what's been going on in the country right now, and um, and I was like, and on top of it, it's the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre, right? And I sent him a meme. And he, was, and he hit me back, can we do something that deals with 
the 100th anniversary of, to of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe so. So what we decided on doing is like a primer um, that actually kind of deals with the, the founding of you know, the Greenwood uh, uh, district and also its subsequent destruction uh, by a mob of angry white people who are like basically using this uh, trumped up uh, event uh, involving this young man and, and, and young lady on this elevator to destroy the Greenwood district, right? And also, but also the fact that they start building almost immediately too. That's the other thing a lot of people forget or don't know right. that almost immediately they started rebuilding that area, you know? Mm -hmm. And so Alvin Ball, the same day, sent me a proposal. He was like, hey, I saw your post about the Greenwood district. I'm working on a graphic novel called Greenwood. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, this is serendipitous. So yeah, so we crashed the schedule and I think, I thought that Stacy would be per the perfect illustrator for it. But we can uh, go through these like relatively quickly. Stacy, you wanna talk about some of the process or anything like that? Yeah, so um, what I did not have at the time of Alfon uh, working on Alfonso was <clears throat> the Pro in a program called Procreate. Um, I am working 100% digitally on these instead of uh, working on paper and then translating that. Um, I am working straight to the iPad Pro. After you spend $900 on the, uh, the iPad Pro and then $100 on the Apple Pencil, so you drop the G on that, the app itself costs $10. Wow. That I'm using yep. to create it. This $9.99. Is <laughs> right, because um, as I taught uh, my illustration class, for example, a few years ago, I had a student, she was using Procreate. She didn't have a stylus. So she used her finger on her phone to create comics. Right? <laughs> so you can draw with your finger uh, in Procreate, right? This is important for thinking about and looking at process and how, how to create comics. So these are some of the first pages. Uh, you can keep going. And by the way, these are gonna be in color too. Uh, these will definitely be in color, yes. Yeah, Solomon, Solomon Robinson, our wonderful flatter and, and, and Stacy's son is actually uh, a coloring assistant on this. He also helped on uh, Parable of Sower and on Kindred too. Absolutely. So the book is filled with uh, certain landmarks and giving a little bit of the history process, right? So as Alvern sent me the script and he's like, yeah, so uh, we're gonna show a picture of the, the Dreamland Theater, for example, or this particular library, this particular high school, et cetera. Um, I wanted to, you know, it might say a, a couple standing or some people standing in front of it. The story for me began there, right? So I'm like, okay, I could show people standing in front of a Dreamwood Theater, but what are they doing? So you have a couple walking by, you have a woman walk by, you have a father with kids walking by, you have a couple walking by. Um, and I wanted to show life in Greenwood. I wanted yeah. to show some regularity to the life, but I wanted to show the beauty of Black people, right? Too many times when we're talking about um, the Tulsa Race Massacre, we're talking about the destruction of the community. And sometimes we're, we're also talking about the destruction of people, but I want to show the opulence of this life. I want to show that this was Wakanda, right? Mm -hmm. As we're talking about this right. really imaginative, beautiful Black Panther space that, you know, I call the Afro now, not the Afro future. I wanted to show that we've had We've had this several times in history and through almost the same exact means, our black spaces are constantly destroyed because of their affluence, right? right. So one of the things I say is, you know, this is a great example. You know, we, we can't live, we can't live with, with we can't uh, be segregated from white people uh, because our communities are destroyed, but then we can't be integrated with white people because then our black bodies are destroyed. Right. It is the, the most, most the, the best example I can think of, of a toxic relationship over <laughs> 400 years. Yes. Right. Totally. Totally. Um, so I wanted to look at, I wanted to show some of these. These are some of the very first images. Uh, please don't take any pictures of this, y'all. Oh, my God. On the web. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, and thank you for sharing this, because um, I think we had let you know that our conference next year for the Black Caucus American Library Association, the National Conference of African American Librarians mm -hmm. got moved. It was the 50th anniversary this year, but mm -hmm. it's going to be next year in Tulsa. In Tulsa. And so, yeah. Yeah, we're planning to continue this partnership so that when we're in Tulsa for the conference, we're 
all still talking about comics. Yeah, we and should like, definitely be there. We should yeah, we're well, trying to do that. I mean, I think that uh, I've been talking to Dexter Nelson, who's over at the um, at one of the at the uh, the Tulsa or no the Oklahoma uh, History Museum. Who want they're gonna they want to do something uh, you know around that. Also with Bitterroot too, because you know Bitterroot is connected to Tulsa, yeah. and we actually plan to have this ready. That we're like in production like really good right now. Uh, Dr. Ronaldo Anderson. We'll go back to production, yes. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ronaldo Anderson and Dr. Uh, Colette Yell Yellowrobe, who's a Native American scholar, are actually doing a contextualizing essay about the history of the district and also the state of Oklahoma as well. But from a from a two-tiered, like it's not just African-American history, but also the, the, the Native people who are connected to that land as well, like the Osage people, for instance. So all that's being incorporated is it's gonna be like a teaching guide as well for this. Mm -hmm and that we want to have ready for the 100th anniversary of the massacre. Um, and that this, is critical because I think when you have the discussion guide or the teacher's guides that you yes. know, it just gives the teacher a tool so that they have ideas of what to do with this comic in the classroom. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. going to be very much a, bit a part of it. So that it'll be, and also um, I think that Abrams uh, is planning to actually print up extra few thousand of these to actually give to students and um, yeah, and, and and some of the proceeds are going to go to the uh, the Greenwood. Excuse me, the uh, the Black Wall Street. No, that's not right. The Greenwood uh, Historic uh, Center, History Center. Yeah, <laughs> the one that's there there in Greenwood. Um, so we also had a few uh, recommendations, and we can go through those quickly so we get to questions. I'm sorry. Uh, I see Josephine Baker was already on your list, right? Um, that's actually distributed through Abrams. Uh, through, uh, I think it's by. Um, Self-Made Hero, I believe, is the publisher. Uh, I saw that our friend Joel Christian Gill is also on your list for um, for some of his work with the Town of the Tenth. But this is a I book about this cover because I had this medallion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is about I know that's crazy. This is about his life. So this is basically like a autobiographical comic told through the different fights that he's had in his life. Wow. Yeah, which is really, yeah, which is also really interesting because it actually the entire graphic novel I feel like takes a, takes the place of a very split moment in time as he's right. with his son, right? So in the beginning of the book, he's having a conversation with his son. And at the end of the book, he's still having that conversation with his son. So in, really interestingly, the entire graphic novel, you know, I forget how many pages it is, almost like takes place in a second. Yeah, it's, it's a flashback. And it's like, it's, yeah, it's such a great Sounds graphic. like the Bhagavad Gita. Oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. Had the conversation on the edge. I can't remember. My dad will be mad. I should know this. It's like don't be, don't be mad. Yeah, Kyle Baker's Nat Turner, which is actually again published by Abrams Comic Arts, um, is uh, and actually it was first published by him uh, um, independently, and it was collected and and uh, recolored and and put out through um, Abrams Comic Arts. But essentially, this is a translation of the actual trial of Nat Turner. Mostly, it's. Um, it's a, a, a wordless comic, actually. It's beautifully done. Be mm -hmm. uh, Kyle Baker is a master storyteller, yes. master storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, another master storyteller who, by the way, I'm working with right now on a brand new graphic novel is uh, Hoshe Anderson. He's writing a graphic novel with, uh, and, and uh, it's called um, The Resurrectionists. And it's set in like, uh, it's set in um, 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 New York during like the turn of the century. And uh, the illustrator is, um, is, uh, is, is Jeremy Love, who did Bayou. And uh, anyway, but this particular piece, I know, right? <laughs> this particular piece uh, is, is, I think it took him a decade to make. This is the King, the, the, uh, the King graphic novel, which is by Dr. Martin Luther the King. And, uh, <laughs> and it's his, you know, it's a really interesting take on, the, on, on, on Dr. King because, you know, Hoche Anderson's from, from, from uh, Canada. And so basically, I think this kind of uh, distance from, from, from King actually gives us a really rich, um, ir not necessarily irreverent, but definitely a, a more humanizing effect on, on King as a, as a man. Um, next slide, please. Go do this part. Yeah, so again, um, Abrams on, on the right put out Drawn Power, which is a, a story about uh, um, the Me Too, it's a collection of stories about the Me Too movement. It just won uh, Best Collection uh, at, at the Eisner's. Uh, and also Prince of Cats, which is by if you're into, uh, have you heard of Prince of Cats? No, I'm, I'm yes. the cover on the other one, I'm still. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And yeah, the Prince of Cats is by Ron Wimberley. It's essentially Romeo and Juliet, but told through the eyes of Tybalt, 
Oh, okay. The Prince of Cats, right? And so it's almost like if you took the, the 80s movie, The Warriors, and mixed it with Rashomon, and... I'm sold. If, yeah, it's pretty amazing, actually. It's, it's, oh, great. They're making a movie out of it, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Kate Stanfield is playing Tybalt. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot, please. Okay. Yeah, so Upgrade Soul uh, oh, cool. by Ezra Clayton Daniels. Oh, my God. It's like one of the best graphic novels I've ever read. <laughs> it took him 15 years to make. And then, of course, Hot Cone. Look at her showing oh. out. Got the, got, the, got the receipts, which just won uh, uh, an Eisner as well. You know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, it's a great book, great book. But yeah, Upgrade Soul is wonderful too. Please pick it up when you get a chance. All right, so uh, next slide. LaGuardia, which also just won Eisner and a Hugo Award, is essentially, is by Nadia Korafor, who actually we've adopted, uh, we adapted one of our short stories as a lead book for our Megascope line. Uh, as a good friend, and uh, it's about an incident that she that occurred to her that happened to her when she was going through LaGuardia, the airport, and it's about immigration, and it's just really crazy, like uh, sci-fi sci story about like American, you know, immigration. Um, uh, and also uh, from MBM Publishing is the Billie Holiday graphic novel, which is gorgeous. It's a big, oversized volume. I'm sorry. <laughs> Unless they were saying books, I just want to get to the. I'm sorry, you guys have this uh, this PDF. Just say we're, we're saying books too fast, so we can't get to the links. I'm so. Sorry. Oh, no, <laughs> these, uh, but she said, "No, it's wonderful." Okay, uh, both of these are, are written by uh, by David Walker, who is also the writer for Bitterroot, which you also have on your list. I saw. Um, so Frederick, it's basically like a graphic novel about the the life of Frederick Douglass. His follow up is um, about the Black Panther Party. And um, yeah, so these are both by David Walker and he's kind of going into doing more of these books about black culture and about black resistance strategies, so. That's, we need more of that. Uh, go to, yeah, so that's Bitterroot. I actually am, which also just won, uh, you know, an Eisner for best continuing series. I have the honor of being the, uh, the editor for the back matter of the book. So if you go through back Bitterroot, You'll find like essays about the Harlem Renaissance up to, con to connect to the story. Um, Stacy actually has written two for 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 us for Bitterroot for the back matter. Um, it's a really great teaching resource too. It's, but basically, in the back of the books, each issue has contextualizing essays and art and all kinds of things that connect to the story. You already have our friend Jerry Craft's uh, amazing book, New Kid. Um, Jerry Craft is also the co-founder of the Schomburg uh, Black Comic Festival, along with myself, uh, Dr. Jonathan Gales, and the amazing Deirdre Holman, right? Um, okay, next, uh, this might be it. Uh, oh, yeah, no, Victor Laval's Destroyer. Uh, yeah, that was on our list too, yeah. That's on your list too. So basically, if you want to teach about Frankenstein and the Black Lives Matter movement at the same time, except no substitutes. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> Destroyer is like a great, I teach it every year. And then uh, finally, uh, Nadia Korofor um, wrote this book, excuse me, this short story called On the Road, which I love. It's a horror story about this woman who it come, has to come to grips with her, her own culture and her own dark past to kind of move into the future. So I adapted this uh, with uh, the amazing David Brame into a, into a graphic novel. This is the first book from our Megascope line. Next slide. Please. Oh, yeah. Megascope is a new venture that I'm the curator of, uh, basically because of the success of the, uh, the Octavia Butler books, I was able to pitch an idea to, Mega, uh, to Abrams Comic Arts called Megascope. The title of our of, of Megascope comes from a science fiction story written by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, it was found a few years ago. It's called The Princess Steel. And in that particular short story is a, is a, um, a device called the Megascope that actually allows you to see into different dimensions. So that would be a great, title for for imprint so we're focusing on primarily speculative fiction by and about people of color so science fiction fantasy horror all about uh people of color we're also yeah. looking at historical fiction we're doing a, a emmett till graphic novel uh we're also doing like adaptations we're doing a futuristic version of the count of monte cristo set in set 400 years after the polar ice, ice caps melt and uh yeah and so we're we're doing like a bunch of books check out the the, the list and, and we're making amazing books for for librarians to 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 give to their students uh and and the tulsa race massacre book that stacy's illustrating is going to be one of the books on that list as well and i think that's it thank you that's all that's all that's, it. that's all she wrote for me yeah <laughs> so. all right let me open this back up because i haven't been able to see the chat while we were going it's a, i thought i saw a couple questions coming through 
I've been trying to read it too. So um, no, there, there, there are definitely some questions. So I want to thank everybody who's you know been with us for the first hour. If you need to um, tap out, understood. And then we're going to take a look at some of the questions that we've uh, got for these guys here. Let me just scroll through. I see a lot of the links. Teach somebody needs wants the teacher's guides. All right, so let's see what we've got for you. First question from Casey Cox and is asking what advice could you give to those in the library and information science fields that are trying to pave the way for more inclusion of political comic books? Mm. That's a good question. Uh, advice, I mean, I guess, you know, I guess do it. I mean, I, you know, it, I, I don't know, it's, it depends on the space. I mean, a lot of times, you know, um, there's some pushback about, about comics, but there, there seems to be more, um, a, a wider variety of comics about different types of political, you know, active spaces, just like the, the Drawing Power book, for instance, you know, which is critically acclaimed and, and actually uh, extremely well executed. Uh, I'm planning to, to probably do a, a Black Lives Matter oriented uh, collection for the line as well. Yeah. Um, I guess it depends, politics are kind of a slippery slope, right, because it depends on the, po the political atmosphere of the institution you're working with. Um, I think, I think it's, as long as you have a lot of different diverse voices speaking through comics that I think that's the way to start. To kind and then, of, you know, sometimes it's hard with the, it, with just the fact that there are images, you know, like yeah. there are books that we're able to, you know, collect and put on the shelves where um, folks are not looking as quickly. And when I was a teen librarian, I often felt like when I got a graphic novel, even if I had read all of the different reviews, I still needed to flip through the comic book every single page just so that I had eyes on every image so that if I was challenged mm -hmm. by somebody, I saw what was in there yeah. and speak to it. And sometimes I couldn't make that determination until the book arrived. Right, 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 right. That's why advanced readers copies are very important. You know? mm -hmm. The other thing too, I guess doing things like this, you know, where you're actually speaking directly to the constituencies and, and having forums about it, you know, and, mm -hmm. And speaking about the importance of images, you know, it's always been comics have always been fraught. The history has always been fraught in our country for some reason. You know, I, I, I don't understand it. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying I think it's like these tensions between like institutional spaces around literacy and about appropriateness and things of that nature. But you know, comics are just so powerful. I don't, I don't see why we can't embrace them. You know. All right. So the second question here from Tatanisha Love, who is on our committee. Um, with Kindred, how did you determine which would words from the book would be used in the graphic novel and which ones would be taken out and conveyed with images? That's very difficult. I mean, basically one of, one of the things is like show don't tell sometimes. It's kind of like the mantra for comics. Right. Um, Damien what did had the heavy lifting of actually taking the text and, and, and turn it to a script. So what we decided to do, or what lead, we had a great editor, Sheila Keenan, on this book too, was language that actually like repeat itself as far as like characters go a lot of that was taken out because basically if a character sometimes a lot of times a character is what the character does you know so there's yeah. things like that um we try to be as uh um reverent as humanly possible to right. the themes of the book you know uh, but the, the truth of the matter is that medium, as soon as you start changing the medium of something it changes the story because each medium has different affordances right and that's the thing too is it's a really good thing to teach students about is that each storytelling method has this list of tropes and affordances that, that you have to be considerate of, right? And that's kind of like the thing too. So uh, we, we basically were trying to like stick to language and visuals that actually to us got to the heart of what the story was about. You know, and we did that through like, I mean, essentially Octavia Butler was our, was our third collaborator, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we were trying to be as very um, meticulous about how she described the story, so. I mean, I know it can be hard because sometimes there's, you know, very dialogue heavy. Yep. Novels, and it's then, so difficult. You know, yeah. it'll be pages and pages of conversation without a specific action. Yep. And so, so Damien, what he would do is actually try to create a, to try to, to try to have them doing something um, that, that kind of uh, mitigated that, that quote unquote boredom, you know, because, <laughs> you know, again, you know, uh, Prose is very good for atmosphere and for, for language, whereas like comics are great for action, right? It's for action sequences and stuff. So the thing is like trying to play off the affordances of, the of type and image and how they play off of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
All right, so then I'm going to go to a new a new person, Karina Oliva Carose, who asked. Oh, which I just answered. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why did you change it? Alfonso. In the process presentation of, say again? Yeah, no. Why did you change the letters? Yeah, yeah. I didn't change that. In the process presentation, <laughs> I used PH because it was a typo. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was that question. It's actually F is Alfonso spelled with F. That's how Tony uh, spelled it. And that's the correct way to spell it. Yeah. Uh, I, it's just a typo in the presentation. I didn't even catch that until um, that question was asked. So thank you. <laughs> <I'll go back. laughs> but that was also part of the process, right? So, and, and um, that was the process of, of uh, sketching out the cover, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't make, it wasn't, I had nothing to do with the type necessarily. That's just me putting in, um, you know, typing out. This is where the title would go. And I spelled the title wrong. <laughs> That's all that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love the fact that it was like, what is the meaning of that? It is. Right. 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 The meaning is Russian. <laughs> yeah, we're Russian and we try to get it. Yeah, right. you know, right. And talk. someone else was asking a good one about expressing happiness and anger. Do you use specific colors or shapes? Yes. Yeah. Um, what are they? What are they coded? The different colors. It depends on the story, honestly. I want to say, like, in, um, you know, of course, like the ones that we respond to a lot, like red, you know, in particular is, a, you know, is a strong color, you know, that people respond to um, that relates to a lot of different things around passion, you know. Um, I think what we do is, like, you code it with the with the pantomime. You know, we're used to reading what faces look like, you know what I'm saying, as far as, like, cartoons and stuff. So you kind of, like, are kind of a casting director. Or you, so, you know, you, you marry the color to the, to the, to the to the um, yeah. way that the char character's acting, uh, we did have a lot of color coding in Kindred, for instance. You know, uh, one one of the things, of course, is that when when Dana was time traveling, a lot of times, you know, when you see movies about time travel, the past is actually kind of drained of, of color, right? But because of how Octavia Butler described the story, she was like, "Well, it seemed like um, the past actually was more rich and more real to her," you know. And so we actually made the past when she was traveling to the past, like full of color, right? And yeah, I'm then, we at used, that. then we used like kind of blood red, almost like a scab, you know, is, is I actually sampled images of like bruises to make that color because so much of it was about family trauma and about blood, blood kinship, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then for us that the present, their present is still the past. But the truth of the matter is that when she moves into, uh, when they move into their new home, they haven't made any new memories in that house yet. So they're still disconnected from that house as a home. And they, and it's kind of eerie and creepy how easy it is for her to call the past where she's a slave home. You know, it's disturbing actually. Anyway, I know that was, that's not, it wasn't exactly what you, what you, what you, what you uh, wanted to hear, but it was like, yeah, that it just kind of went in that direction. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, the book is, it's scary. You know, like, well, you know, we won a hot, we won the Bram Stoker Award for it. It's a horror yeah. award. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, someone asked Jerusha Saldana Yanez, how do you decide when an image can stand alone and when it needs text? Mm. Honestly, I think, you know, if a well done image, and you can speak of this too, Stace, uh, a well done image should be able to speak by itself per period. Yeah. You know, I think it depends on the script and what, what they're for. Because remember like comics, the way we do comics is highly collaborative. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that's determined by what the writer is putting down and what the writer's thinking about, so. Yeah, and and uh, one of my favorite artists, Brian Stelfreeze, um, I call him the Yoda of comics or the James yeah. of comic books. <laughs> you know, he's your favorite producer, his favorite producer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he's, he's like Jay Dilla of comics. He's the Jay Dilla of comic books, right? right. You know, um, the last critique I got from him, I showed him some pages I'd worked on a few years ago, and he told me about storytelling. He was like, "Tell the story. Don't just tell the story that the script tells you. Right? What is happening? What else is happening that the script is not telling you?" And I thought that was very, very important. So in Alfonso, for example, I love talking about this. Um, there was, there was, I noticed as I read the book and I was, as I was illustrating it, there was no depiction of Alfonso's parents together um, pre uh, the father's imprisonment, right? So I'm like, well, I'm gonna show, I wanna show, and I was, I was looking at, at the script. I'm like, I really wanna put something in there. And I found this place where I, I showed Alfonso's parents 
dancing in the living room. Really simple image, right? That's not in the script, but it tells a it tells something very, very different about the intimacy of Alfonso's parents, right? So it, I, I, that didn't, that wasn't, I don't, there might've been text in that panel. Uh, you have to check the book and see, but that wasn't in the script, right? So when I told Tony about it, he was totally fine with me putting it in there. The editor was as well, and there was space. Um, what is the story? You know, I think it's important that as a storyteller, I even just as, as in Tulsa, right? The script is not calling to show the intimacy of these families, for example. But when we talk about Tulsa and that the history of Tulsa or the Greenwood district, many times we're talking about the destruction of this land and the destruction of people, but it's spoken about in a particular way where I feel that um, it, it, it actually dehumanizes the, the, the population, right? Of this black populace, right? I think it, it, so I'm like, I'm trying to put that back into the script Mm -hmm. in places where the script doesn't necessarily call for that. But I'm like, I can show these kids playing. Mm -hmm. I can show, you know, the, these black people waving at each other across the street, right? Mm -hmm. Humanness, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the type of things that you miss when you're talking about the destruction of black people many times, right? It, it's the type of thing that uh, when, you know, where, for example, um, a, um, I think Dylan Roof, Roof, uh, Roof right? Um, after he, he killed the, um, the nine members of, of Emmanuel, right? The police put a, a vest on him, protective vest. They took him to Burger King, right? right? Yeah. Now, they, they humanized him, right? Are you okay? Almost rewarded him for a job well done. You know, we mm -hmm. could say it as plainly as that, right? And when I'm looking at this, when I'm looking at um, black people who are killed, for example, too many times they're going back to like when he was 10 years old, he stole a piece of candy from the store, right? They, they try to take away this person's humanity. Right. Through the story, I try to insert the humanity of, of black people whenever I possibly can. Most of the books I work on are, are black books, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I feel because I, I, at 48, I'm like, how much time do I have left on this planet? I got to <laughs> tell our stories, yep. right? Yep. So I think in a particular way, that's kind of how I address um, this, the ideas of stand, you know, standalone images, which ones get yep. text. I know that we read text in different ways and text and image in different ways. So I play on that. Yep. You're going to read this text. You're going to read these black bodies in the way that I want you to read this text. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, with the making picture books, people often get surprised. They don't realize that the editor gets the manuscript and then the artist gets to choose how to split up and, and tell the story. And, you know, there may be certain details that are given, you know, like there should be this on this page as like a clue or something for something that's going to happen later. But um, I'm sure you guys probably had a chance to see The Undefeated by... Um, Kadir Nelson and Kwame Alexander. It's a picture book that got the Caldecott medal this year. Oh, yeah, right. got King yeah. medal. And one of the strongest pages in the book is a page where there's nothing. Yeah. You know, it's like the line says, this is for the those who didn't make it. And mm -hmm. then you, it's just a blank page. And the power of that blank page in a picture book, you know, where there's supposed to be pictures. The first time I saw it brought me to tears, you know? Mm -hmm. Back to it, you know, you just sit with it, and there's something about mm -hmm. without having the words, like um, John was saying earlier, with the double page spread that forces you to linger. That's right. There's no words. And that was a funeral too, by the way. You saw that. That was a funeral. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it images. Man, it's, it just breaks my heart, like how how images are treated. We, we get inundated with them so much. We need to learn how to read them faster, quicker. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like, well. Why why don't kids learn how to read these things earlier? What is, what is the agenda for that? You know what what are they, what are we trying to, what type of uh, critical thinking skills are we trying to get across to them at an early age? You know, I want when you know my son's like fourteen months now, fifteen months now. Um, I want him to be able to, to to discern images early. You know because he's already like up in the screen. You know baby yeah. sharks baby sharks and all right. <laughs> so it's like I need he needs to know like about how powerful these images are very fast because. They're going to be used against him. They're going to be, 
used to entice them to do things, you know? And I think that we need to actually utilize comics and graphic novels to start inundating people with that type of knowledge and critical thinking. So then this might be, as we get to, towards the end, a good time to ask you guys to explain to everybody what you are doing with Black Kirby and what that is and, and how it is a response to visual imagery. Well, uh, Stacey, you wanna start with that or? Sure, um, Black Kirby began as um, um, around two, 2012, I believe it was, was mm -hmm. a Avengers movie was about to drop. And John and I had been, um, we, through fortunate, you know, unfortunate or very fortunate, I look at it now, um, <laughs> circumstance where we were at a comic book convention and we, due to overbooking, we were placed in the auditorium on a stage by ourselves. It's hilarious. Like we was like. <laughs> right. So they had to filter in people to say, oh yeah, there are other people. Oh yeah, there. there's other people on the stage in the room. On the stage <laughs> in there, right. <laughs> so what happened was John and I imagined for eight hours, we got to really sit and converse with each other about each other's work. We had known about each other's work. But for eight hours, we got to really talk about each other's work. And we found out we had so many overlaps. I was a beginning theorist. John was already rolling in, in theory and comics practice. I was beginning in it in a particular way. And um, the Avengers movie, so this was around 2008. By the time we finished that conversation, we had already started collaborating. We had decided we were gonna start collaborating. When the Avengers movie was coming out, Jack Kirby wasn't getting credit for his creations. Jack Kirby created, you know, the Avengers, <laughs> right? And Black Panther, yeah. right? And we, and I think John said, well, damn, they're treating this second generation Jewish immigrant like he black. They ought to call him Black Kirby. <laughs> we were like, oh, wait a minute. Wait, hold up, hold up. Right. Right. So it became this vehicle, this moniker. Um, in which we could really confuse audiences uh, where, you know, and, and then celebrate um, the critiques that we have of, of, of comics, but through this really critical uh, vehicle that, that, that in which we create graphic novels and, and now graphic novels, because at first it was, it was exhibitions that traveled right. internationally, but our audience wanted us to create graphic novels. Alfonso was our first one, but it really came through this critique and this celebration of the second generation Jewish immigrant that's, that literally was being erased through cinema, right? right? So as Stanley, everybody knows who Stanley is. He's in the movies and- like the Walt Disney and comics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But Jack Kirby was, was not as vocal even back in the day Right. And then as the movies are coming out, he's not even being mentioned as a creator, a co-creator of this really awesome uh, franchise and series of franchises. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, he created Captain America for God's sake. You know, <laughs> this is like when I found out about Milton Finger, you know. Bill, um, Bill Finger. Yeah, right. Bill Finger. Bill Finger, right. Batman. Yeah. 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 Um, right, exactly. I, I, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember I read the, a picture book um, that- oh, you know, yes. I'm gonna um, get his name wrong, but so I'll, we'll put a link in um, about Bill Finger, and I just was blown away. You know, you he know, was, he was mistreated. So I mean, man, <laughs> so, no yeah. credit. Yeah, I have a whole other commentary about how your own people will do you dirty. For real, I mean, <laughs> yeah. so that, that's that's some of the things that we're talking about. So so Black Kirby became like, as Stacy said, a moniker for this entity that, that essentially is like in a, that lives in another universe where Jack Kirby's black. So instead of like using, so like Captain America becomes Major Sankofa. Like the, that's the character behind me, that's Major Sankofa. Um, so uh, Shango stands in for Thor, that kind of thing. So instead of using like Norse mythology or Greek mythology for the characters, he's using like, you know, West African and Egyptian mythology and, and, and belief structures. But also, you know, these characters are created in the 1960s so if he's a black creator making comics, he's definitely going to be in the struggle, probably, right? Or more, more likely to be connected to the struggle. Mm -hmm. So we actually thought about like, well, these kind of like uh, they kind of gloss over the ideas of like how these comics were talking about black power and black people. What if they were more explicit? That kind of thing. That's why you get this this image of um, of Huey and as the black as T'Challa in the wicker chair that Stacy did, right? Or 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 the conflation of like you know, Malcolm X and, and Magneto, because they kind of made up the idea that, you know, those particular uh, people were like connected in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so we just kind of like started playing around with those ideas. And Black Kirby became like a kind of Afro pop 
um, surrealist um, Afrofuturist hip hop duo. And then we started doing like um, talks about this and actually teaching from that space. One of the things that, that we love the most is the idea of the illibus. Yeah. The illustrated, the illustrated syllabus. Yeah, you just dropped it in the thing. So basically what happened was we were, we for a while wanted to do something about Luke Cage, you know, and we um, were inspired by Cheo Hadari Coker's vision of the character for the for Netflix, right? And, and the idea is that, you know, Luke Cage has always kind of stood in for like black men in the Marvel Universe to a certain degree, you know, and they would they would change him according to what was how black people were being seen in the media, you know, but he's, oh, yeah. he's kind of a proxy or index for like black masculinity. So the idea for the illibus was that we we base it off the quarter system, you know, because we we're going to do it here at the University of California uh, at, the, at the Culver Center. And so we had 10 prompts. And from those 10 prompts, we created a, a soundtrack and we used most deaf, you know, or the mighty, the mighty Yassin, bay, 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 right? Anyway, <laughs> um, and so we created this, this playlist that actually, the titles actually were like talking points, you know? So when you walk into the show, you have these different kind of like iterations of the character and then you have the talking points. That's a class right there already because you have the images are visual text and you have the talking points, you know? Yeah. which actually relate directly to this playlist. And then we actually install the books that we used into this. So you have a bibliography, you have yeah. a playlist, you have like visual images that you can, you can talk about and you have prompts. So it's a class. So if you go in there as a, as a teacher, you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is actually a syllabus pretending to be an exhibition. So illustrated syllabus, illibus. So we've done two. Uh, we did one on um, Blue Cage. We did one called Reflection Eternal, okay. named after, you know, the, uh, the, the rap group uh, to deal with Candy Candyman. And now we're getting ready to do one based off of Eben. Uh, the the, the, create, the, uh, the uh, creator, uh, Larry Fuller, created this character called Eben, who's like one of the first black superheroes. And so we're doing this thing called Fear of a Black Planet because yeah. uh, Eben came from a black planet called Nida. You know, there's only one issue of this book. And so we were like, man, he gave us so much with that one issue. And Larry Fuller is with us still. And so he's making art for this show too, you know, because he's actually kept up with the, with the digital tools. So he actually is making digital art. I want to say Larry is in his uh, late seventies and he's still making a lot of digital art. But he was actually one of the first black uh, underground comics artists along with like uh, Ray Thorne and uh, Grass Green. They were actually in the Haight-Ashbury with like people like Spain Rodriguez and, um, and of course, uh, Robert Crumb. I mean, I just gotta say, we really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you. I, we, we appreciate what you're doing too. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're doing so much. <laughs> and I was like, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. You know, it's an honor to be talking to y'all about this. We're very passionate about it. As, as, it looks like as passionate as you are about it. <laughs> so. Trying, trying to keep up with you guys. And um, I guess like the, the last question I have, or just a comment, you know, I think there are those who are totally interested. Both of you guys are Nasir Jones Hip Hop Studies Fellows. As a, uh, the people of Queens want to know, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you get this? Is there a test? Because oh, yeah, I, yeah. I think I'm ready. Albums and songs, or like. nah, uh, it's um, you know, basically, um, you it's it's a it's a position that you have to compete for. I mean, you know, they have they have like um a space where you have to send in a proposal for a hip hop related project. Um, I was working on this thing called the uh, called the Cyber Trap. Uh, so basically, it's like I'm from the South of Mississippi originally, so um, I created this. Uh, along with Stacy and also um, Regina Bradley, this space called the Cybertrap, which is like a transmedia storytelling space that instead of based off of like cyberpunk, it's Cybertrap. So it's based off of trap culture mixed okay. with, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, because if you look at, if you look at future spaces, you know, if, you look, any, if you look at any sci-fi sci stories, don't anything take place in the South. It always takes place in California, New York or Detroit or something. And like, what happened to the to the South? What happened to the dirty, dirty? You know what I'm saying? So basically, the whole idea is like a, it's cli-fi, so it deals with climate fiction and stuff like that. So that was my that was my piece. And actually, I can send you guys. We can send you links to the to they they recorded the talks that we do. But basically, it's a comp, it's competitive like that, and you have to have like uh, letters of recommendation, and then you wait with bated breath to see if you you know get to get to work there. You know. You well, want you know, it just, I felt like a lot of the stuff that I was doing to prepare for this, I was seeing myself, you know, on the page and it was just, you know, 
Man, just, that feel good. In the middle of all of the stuff that's um, happening right now, I think for all of us that were on the committee to take this time together for a week, you know, every week we were meeting for about an hour to talk about um, the books that we wanted to put on the list and mm -hmm. the merits of, you know, the collection and how to balance it age-wise and topic-wise. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we know that the list is not finished. So um, what I'll say to folks is that we're planning to continue this conversation. We're going to be trying to put together targeted lists that are about topics like memoir and biography, Afrofuturism mm -hmm. and stuff like that so that we can pull in some of the um, books that are not on the list we're sending you today. And uh, keep an eye out on our websites um, because we're gonna have a final formatted PDF with the beautiful artwork by Crystal Chen. And I just wanted to thank the task force committee members who helped to organize all of this. And, and I really enjoyed working with you guys and having the conversations. Um, from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, that's myself, Elisa Garcia, Sandra Farag, Chandra Walker, Shati Burns Simpson, who's our president, Tamala Chambers, Tatanisha Love. And then from the graphic novel, comic book Roundtable, table, Alea Perez, Amy Wright, Emily Drew, Matthew No, Miriam Meadow, Patrick Holt, Shira Polarski, Susan Shee, and our staff liaison is Tina Coleman. And um, special thanks to Amy, who really just uh, organized and pulled everything together, um, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Um, is there anything you guys want to say to folks? I've been in the chat. I'm trying to answer as I many questions. <laughs> answer as many questions as I could. <laughs> Yeah. Um, someone, you want to give your contact information again in case we want to reach out to you? Online, John, put yours in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Uh, folks can hit me up on Instagram, uh, Facebook. Uh, email me, Stacy, R S T A C E Y R at Illinois.edu. Yes, I Skype into classes. Pay me mm -hmm. any time. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, my daughter's tuition is not comic book <laughs> money, but I pay it all for comic book money. You know? Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think of what else. And I'm, actually, John, I'm answering it in the, yep, oh, it's in the chat, but also in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, so I'm answering questions. Yeah, I've been trying to ignore that one. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you know, <laughs> someone asked a question earlier about, you know, how can, almost like how can library information science folks fight the struggle, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things I always think about is, I always approach this, I've been a black man for 48 years, you know what I mean? And I always, once I, one of the things I always realize is that everything black people do is cool. We make everything look cool, right? Even our trauma, like remember the Pepsi commercial that came out a few years ago, the Black Lives Matters inspired Pepsi commercial, like, come on, we ain't giving the cops we'll no Pepsi. We are, we are not quenching their thirst on the front lines. That is right. not happening, right? right. Um, but we make everything look cool. Comic books are cool. I don't, yeah. black, I don't, I don't think, and I, I, let me speak for John and myself. We don't address these types of things. We do the work that needs to be done. Emory Douglas has already foregrounded this work. Um, Aaron Douglas has already Aaron foregrounded Douglas. this work. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Jacob Lawrence has foregrounded this work. I don't feel the need to prove this. So I go in into making the work, right? I think that it's important. Now, I understand that you, you know, you all, your profession is very different, right? And you do have to fight this in these particular ways. But I think when you have the opportunity, you show what need, sh do your lectures on what needs to be said and why this is, this is a missed opportunity. I, you know, I, I, I look at it like that. I feel yeah. like, for example, I don't call myself an Afrofuturist. However, the thing that I, I do brand in a very particular way for me, myself, personally, those, those three people, right, is <laughs> you have to show people what the Afro future looks like if you right. want people to actualize it. That's right. the thing that, that governs my every single day, every single project. Am I going to show people what Black freedom looks like, what Black liberated futures looks like? Mm -hmm. Right. I kind of, I do that, right? So I'm not asking people, hey, is it okay if I do that? I'm not asking permission to be great. I'm, I'm over, I'm <laughs> over that. It's right? almost, it's your duty to be great. You know, what, what's yeah. the, you know, it's your duty, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Right. I, we've had ancestors who, who have fought and died for us to, I mean, seriously, I, you know, you talked about we're, we're, you know, both Nazia Jones fellows. 
one of the things I thought about is our ancestors are undocumented workers who built Harvard. Who built, who built Harvard, exactly. They're not <laughs> exactly. Our ancestors built that. They're not documented. This year, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the African and African American Studies program on Harvard's campus. Right. Right? I'm there 50 years later after the building of that, that, you know, for example, I'm there theorizing hip hop as a form of black liberation government when we don't receive reparations, mm -hmm. like mining our own culture um, through sampling, remixing, and, and through the five primary elements of hip hop as a theory, as a visual artist. Guess right. what? My, our ancestors who built Harvard, that would have been their wildest dream. Yep. For real. Like we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. It's, and it's and they're wilding out. <laughs> For they real. are wilding out. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I think I think, you know, and people need to remember this, is like whatever art form, why comics? I'm like, why any art form? We're always trying to look at, you know, ways to like speak with the art. You know, and and every time that there's a there's a social movement, you know, as the Black Lives Matter movement, where there's the Harlem Renaissance, what have you, black power movement. There is always a sister or brother, you know, um, you know, uh, movement of art as resistance. That's how we've always fought with our dance, with our with our language, with our music, you know, uh, and we remix everything we touch and we make it something that the things that are supposed to destroy us we turn it into like strength, you know. Mm -hmm. I call it chitlin hacking. Is what I call it. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm saying like, I'm from the south, so you take it. Chitlins was supposed to, you know, destroy us. You know, it's like, nope, you know, we're gonna use that, eat that, remix that, and turn into something that's gonna empower the future. You know, now because, it's gourmet. What'd you say? Now it's gourmet. You can go to restaurants. Now it's gourmet, and exactly. Fifty dollars a plate for some drink chitlins. It, you know, drink it, drink it, drink it out, of, out, of, out of mason jars. <laughs> like, I was thinking as you were saying too, like you know, people talk about speaking things into existence, and you're, you know, drawing it into existence. Right, no more. Yeah. I would call no more. Right, speaking I'm things. Give you the visual so that you can have, you can imagine right. something different than this. And that's that, magic. Uh, that's I love that. So, thank you. thank you guys. We appreciate you. We'll probably bring you back for every single webinar. <laughs> no. yes. and we're going to expect this audience to be able to answer questions on the last webinar so we can just keep it moving oh, <laughs> taking it level by level um, yeah hit us up online though you know i'm not i need to be more present on twitter but um hit us up like we 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 love to have these conversations we really yeah do. and we're trying to make as many books about about black folk and about liberation and about the future i mean because again you know black joy is also a radical act you yes know? it is Mm -hmm. yeah thanks for having us this was great a lot of fun thank you guys thank you thank you everybody who tuned in have a good night